James Comey, half-assed reporter, and it is a beautiful sunny late July morning. We are in the Hunters Point section of Queens, and we're gonna run in here to the Mosaic Art Space, taking an exhibition by Mike Cockrell. Stay tuned. Yeah. Well, we're out here at the Mosaic Space, Long Island City, Queens, and we're going to uh, try to buttonhole this gentleman, Mike Cockrell, Hello, James. for a little uh, tour, conversation about his exhibition. Does the show have a title? Yes, Drawn From Life. Drawn From Life. Okay, and this represents works from 2004, what? pretty much 2004 to, to now. So it shows a transition from when I was doing the. the You're the transitioning? Narrative. This is my. I'm always transitioning. But this does show a transition. For instance, this painting over here, uh, that's the oldest one that I didn't change. There's older paintings that I actually covered up partly, painted over. So this is Men with Arrows. Plan our future. Okay, well, why don't you come over here? Let's talk a little bit about your career and what's been going on. You've been painting in the New York scene for what, since maybe the early 80s, something like that? Uh, yeah, 1982, I released the White Papers. The White Papers? And then. Briefly that's... give us a little idea of that, what that was about. So that's the cartoon, graphic novelish cartoon. I saw it. Book, and you were in collaboration with Judge Hughes. And Judge Hughes. Hughes. Judge Hughes. <laughs> Judge Hughes. And it, it tracks Kennedy's assassination up to uh, Lennox. So you try to combine the uh, Mark David Chapman murdering John Lennon with, with JFK assassination. In, with growing up in America. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, Talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing, say, when you started out in East Village and that kind of stuff, maybe your relationship with people like Marcus Stabi and that scene? Yeah, I, um, I kind of predate the East Village because I, I was more of a Brooklyn artist, so I showed in Terminal, Monumental. Uh, then I met Mike Bidlow, and he kind of brought me into the East Village scene a little bit. That's where I met people like Marcus Stabi and Ellen Birkenblit and... Uh, I ended up, I think Mike Bidlow got me into Semaphore, and that, that got, that developed a connection for me to ah, these artists, ah. okay. which is great, but I was never really... So uh, you didn't show at Civilian Warfare or Gracie Mansion or any of those places, or were I you did, included I, in some of the group shows and stuff? Gracie Mansion had my, had the white papers. Um, I was in a lot of show in the, shows in the East Village because of Robert Costa. He. He curated a lot of shows and he put me in a lot of different spaces, but I was in Ground Zero with James and Marguerite. Sure. That. Um, David Vonerovich was showing there and some other people. Yeah, I was, uh, I ended up being in a lot of shows and galleries that I didn't even know about. <laughs> okay, let's get back and look at some of the paintings. So this is the earliest piece in the show, Men with Arrows. It's actually an earlier one, but we'll talk about it later. Okay. I painted over part of it. The 1960s looms large. This abstract laundry. And this is all oil paint, right? Yeah. Would you consider yourself an oil painter? No. No, okay. I mean, I, 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 there's, half these paintings are acrylic. This abstract, this, so that modern breakdown that I had in 2012 when I changed my work, you see elements of that in the laundry bag. And so, so when was the uh, Men with Arrows? Is 19... 2004, 2004. And then 10 years later, 2014, I'm painting this abstracted woman, but she has the hairdo. 
Okay. But that, that fragmentation led to the existential man. Existential man. Right. Okay, so you're into philosophy? I think I always was into philosophy. Okay, I'm can into you name three existentialist philosophers? Well, Nietzsche. Eh, uh, me, okay, okay. I mean, you know. Okay, okay, there's so two. That's two, you got one more. Well, I Time think, is running. I think in a way, uh, Faulkner, it, without really? realizing it. Really, okay. <laughs> Faulkner gives us the first existential what, because, yeah. <laughs> Which is a clock without hands. A ticking clock that had no hands. He's credited with the first existential in, really? in literature. Before Albert Camus and Albert all those Camus. guys. So is this any kind of like chronological layout that you've done here? Or are you just um, kind of putting things together uh, narratively or... I did not curate the Subject show. wise or? I, this, okay. This, these works were selected from my studio by uh, Andreas Picotti at, at, uh, and, so, and others here at Mosaic. They came to my studio and picked out work. Okay. Um, they wanted to show the old, the old style going to the new style. So, Your transitioning transition. period. Here's another existential man. You know, I used to work for Merrill Lynch. And I know it's like to have post-its on your wall and work in a cubicle. When were you working for Merrill Lynch? In 1980, 81, 82. Okay, so that was before it got totally crazy and they had all the big program trading and uh, super hedge yes, fund things I happening. That, I saw that coming. They talked about it. They knew it was coming, computer trading. It was just beginning. This guy's going to work. And I think I saw a show of this uh, work at, what was the gallery Kent, you were? Kent, yeah, at no. Kent, that's right. It was on 10th Avenue at that time or 11th uh, Avenue? Yes, yes. I think that was when they were up there. Now we're kind of more recent. This is more recent. Okay. Uh, well, just for my own cursory viewing of this, because I kind of follow some of your stuff on... Uh, Instagram and stuff like this. So you've gotten a lot more involved with the collaging things on there. Correct. Now you talked about working over old paintings and uh, reworking them. Are these all basically done fresh or are you like laying stuff over old paintings and gluing it down and then reworking it or? In this case, it was a new painting, but I kept failing. <laughs> kept failing. <laughs> You know, I keep changing it, so I think there's a lot of struggle in my work that I'm, I'm not uncomfortable showing. Um, I, I decided that making art sometimes is like a slow motion cage fight. You know, you, you get to see all the, everything that went wrong. But, um, there's and is this acrylic or is this, no, this is mixed wide. media? This is acrylic, so I okay. can glue on top of it. That's right. And I can pull fabric off, I can draw. At some point, if I decide to do a more fin, I'll give you an example where I do acrylic and oil. The next one. And this is what? That's about five by six and a half feet, something like that? Yeah, it's 84 inches wide. Okay, so that's seven by. 72 by 80, 86. Six by seven, something it's like that. The Egyptians. And this is just recent, right? This, this is, is. This is 2016 to 2019. It took three years. And there's so many, they went through so many phases. To figure out the right women and well, the right monsters. Okay, one of the things I was going to say is that uh, I've always admired your skills as a drafts person. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about some of your, your academic training? How did you uh, study before you came to, to New York? So you see this kind of line drawing. I liked Angra. And I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Angra, or as some people refer to him as Angs, Ang, the yeah, French the academic French. master. Right, and Cockney thinks that he had a camera obscura. It's total nonsense. Oh, Cockney thinks everyone had a camera I mean, obscura. Hockney doesn't know how to draw. That's why he can't. Oh, actually, Hockney does know how to draw. <laughs> no, he, he knows how to draw very well. No. I like Hockney's drawings, but they're primitive compared to Ang. So well, they're not photo-ish, you know. If that's your goal, I guess that's that you might say that Angs is better, but as just as far not as better. using line and not things better. like that, I think Hockney I, is a master drafts person himself. Uh, he's really baffled by artists that draw as if it's almost like a photo without using a photo. Ang could do that. 
But anyway, um, I like doing the different vernaculars of drawing. So this is also very abstracted. So I don't have a preference for, that's a cat. We'll take your word for it. Okay. Kitty cat, the eyes, and <laughs> Whatever so, you say. So <laughs> and it's kind of echoed with this girl and the cat yeah. costume here. Now this is a combination of acrylic, collage, oil, and I, and I glued on her for clothes. Blouse. Are you using your daughter's old clothes to No, do these, these are men's shirts. <laughs> okay. All of these, are, and I purposely am using um, men's clothing. Cut up their shirts. Actually, purposely using men's clothing? Yes, they're, men, they're business, business clothes. Okay. Uh, so you're talking about the face being painted in oil. Is there a reason for that? It's just easier to model with the, the oil. It stays wet and you can sort of yes, I can do more slip can things do more around, nuanced. slide it around and nuanced, okay. You can get nuanced in ways that I cannot get with acrylic. Let's keep like moving down the line. So you're a fan of Ang's and classic draftsman, <laughs> draftspersonship. Absolutely. Uh, but I was asking about your academic training. You went to the Pennsylvania Academy, Pennsylvania, Academy Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, okay. which is where Thomas Eakins and some other uh, well-known... William Desiderio. Okay. Well, He's Harvard. a contemporary. He's a contemporary. But this is the thing about go an academic training. You can get stuck there, you know, and I, I'm, or, I, you can break out. And so I think it's always a struggle for me to break out of that academic because I like to well it. but you can never break out of it I mean you can't like take parts of your brain out and, and take them away it's it's always going to be in there I mean you can you can, you can fight it. against it but uh, it's it's always going to be there uh, you can use it as a tool I think it gives you flexibility also I think how old is this one this is fairly new isn't it yes these so are, this these is part of your training transitioning no but this from, is the real deal this is called figurative to yeah this is class portrait there are a series of these paintings class portraits okay um there's a large in MSD or two are sold collectors bought them but these are all kids in rows and uh they became they become increasingly abstract or or if you spend time you can find their personalities in there okay, they have personalities well, let's keep moving down the road so you studied at the Pennsylvania Academy for how long? Four years. Okay, what's the title of this piece? This is, the show gets its title from this. Uh, this is called Drawing from Life, and the show is called Drawn from Life. So it, there's a double meaning in drawing from life. It's his own experiences or my own experiences that I'm drawing from versus drawing from the life model. So that it's also referencing, it's talking about what you're talking about. That academic train drawing from life, the life model, but then you also draw from your life. And this is all acrylic? No. You got some oil paint in there? Here's some oil paint because I had the okay. boy's face. Okay, again, again, it's mixed media. It's mixed media, and then I always like the robot guy, the military bunny man. You know, as people know, my uh, dad was in the Pentagon, and my mom was CIA. At some point, so I would you say, I mean, you were a military kid. grew up in D.C., Washington, I grew up D.C.? In Washington, D.C., around right D.C.? Around D.C.? The, uh, the, um, the military industrial complex. Or as what we would call it now, is, were you part of the family, part of the deep state? Yeah, see, I know that Definitely the in the state, deep state? There's no such thing. Okay, just, well, you know what the first rule of the deep state is, right? You don't tell anybody what you do. You don't tell, you don't admit that there's a deep state. Everyone knows if you say there's no deep state, you're part deep, deep, deep in the deep state. But they're basically Washington, D.C. They're just permanent federal workers. Permanent federal workers. They've been there for 30 years. Are they still alive? Everybody's hanging out? And uh, well, my parents are retired, and now my sister's retired. And they're, every, if you want a job down north, you better get you know, classified clearance. You gotta be part of the deep get, state. <laughs> Yeah, but basically you just get a government contract, now you're part of the deep state. So you grew up in Washington, D.C., and you're talking about drawing from life, and a lot of these images are dealing with what you're talking about, the 1960s, 50s, 60s, and in a certain way there's almost a uh, illustrator's uh, index of various kinds of images that were used in the 50s and 60s, you know, things that you would see on 
calendars or I like that stuff. Cheap Ooh. magazines. Absolutely. Um, dis what, what you would call discredited forms. Like, I didn't really find myself until I stopped trying to paint like Ang and, and you know and, and Thomas Aikens and and Rothko. I, I, it was hopeless. It's a big uh, big difference between Aikens and Rothko or Ang's and Rothko. Like make them live in the same place. If you figure it out. Now this one is. So a grid of nine panels, nine canvases. Yeah, this is an interesting case. This, she's from 19, I painted her in 1993 from a catalog, from a J.C. JCPenney advertisement, and I put a boy. So I alternated bombs with boys, cartoon image, but it felt static to me. I'd like to send you a picture of, of what it looked like before. And until I realized I need to really much violate it and, and draw over top of it, create this other layer, and then it worked for me. But I did the second layer 25 years later. So I just did this last year on top of an old thing. So are you talking about like an individual panel that you did in 1984, or were the, no, all of them the together in 1984? Was the whole thing was exhibited. That's the only surviving, un oh, okay. unadulterated. Oh, okay. His, this, this is the phone. This is the phone from, 19, uh, from the catalog. That's what a 1993 phone looked like. Gosh, they had phones in 1993? Yeah. <laughs> Cradle phones. Cans on strings or something. So that exploding bunny businessman, well, that's really a different image. Okay, this is a totally different thing. And there is, there is no uh, straight painting. This is all just collage, right? Yeah. Fabric collage. These are good. On cotton duck. Men's shirts. They're blowing up. Okay. So we were talking a little bit about your experience in the East Village, kind of on the periphery, and Mike Beadlow and some other people. Um, how about after that when you started to uh, deal with some of the people that were pioneers in the Williamsburg art scene? like 51 grand and some of that? I really liked showing at uh, 31 grand with... Um, sure. I was like, at that point, I felt like an old uncle. And that was still like 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> I, it was... <laughs> I actually remember going to a show of yours over there and yeah, we had a lot is, of paintings that were from the, that this kind of... This that era. This is from like the... the and so was Men with Arrows. The other one we saw, The Boy in the Basket. Right, okay. Mom. These are from my Williamsburg era. 2004, around there, when I was showing it in 31 Grand. 31 Grand was kind of hot for a couple of years, and uh, then they moved into the Lower East Side probably five years before that scene took off, and then they, uh, they went away. It's kind of hard to make a transition like that. I ended up at Ch in Chelsea, so. Now, would you consider these pieces like this? You've got a lot of the boys with the kind of dominant cheesecake mothers, would you consider these self-portraits? Pretty much. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would say they're from experience, personal experience, knowing that... Ch I was difficult. I drove my mom crazy, you know. And so I would probably do something ridiculous. and. Uh, this is sort of catching that moment where the boys, the mom realizes that, that her little innocent boy is starting to become a threat in a lot of ways. <laughs> she <got> okay. <laughs> she's just sort of throwing up the, the warning. Mike, Mike, what are you doing in the bathroom? <laughs> well, not, not even that, like starting fires, you know. <laughs> oh, you were a fire starter? I did a lot of stuff. <laughs> did you blow anything up? Yes. Okay, and good. I think, I think a lot of this has to do with, um, I would blow up my uh, model airplanes and then I would rebuild them and paint them so you couldn't tell they were like to try to like put them back together. So I was really kind of interested in things that blew up. What's the title of this piece? Failed History. No, 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 no. Un Untitled History with Double Heads. So, like, who gets the title history? 
I do. Right? You do. So she's rewriting it. Maybe this girl of color is rewriting the history that this girl thought she had understood, and that's as a mark. Uh, maybe she's starting to add her own mark to history. That was my feeling. Now, you've done a lot of pieces over the years kind of dealing with adolescent girls. You had your whole series of the <clears throat> girls shooting at that poor, misunderstood group of people, the clowns. Yes. Uh, have you gotten any pushback? You know, a lot, a lot of the <clears throat> forces in the art world are kind of um, speaking about things like the, the Me Too movement and other kinds of things like that. Do people criticize you as kind of maybe exploiting the image of the, of the girls? They got over it. They did you think long. they've gotten over it? They got, well, no, with me. <laughs> um, I, the girls shooting the clowns, that's what yes. they like. They like that. You know, so if you give the they? Girls, some, some of they give like. them an automatic weapon. Okay. <laughs> so we got, not only can we offend the Me Too people, but also the NRA gets thrown in there as well. Uh, we all like, like automatic weapons. Well, it's all good. Okay, well, here's the last piece we're going to look at. I think this one is, you had this on Instagram, or was this on one yeah. of the invites, the evites yeah, that was sent out? Yeah, probably, because it's a real popular image. This is also pretty much painted out a 1993 painting of the moms and the boys. And they got painted out, and then they made new moms. Okay, so this one is also a grid of uh, nine panels, and each one of those is something like 18 by 24, something like that? Yeah. The space shuttle is here. That's left over from 93. Um, I do like the vernacular, American vernacular drawing and painting. You know, it comes from magazines. Do you have any favorite uh, illustrator that you love, that you I like, have been inspired well, by? Well, of course, Norman Rockwell's the uh, same. Yeah, he's a master. Uh, Bernie Fuchs. Bernie Fuchs is a. Uh, okay, Bernie one. Fuchs. Uh, they, 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 back then, like everything was illustrated. Time Magazine and um, Sports Illustrated. And I was yes. fascinated. Actually, the first time I saw a Playboy magazine, I was like in the sixth grade. And what I really liked were the Vargas drawings. I thought they were Oh, amazing. Vargas is, he's fantastic. I thought the, the drawings were interesting. And little Annie Vargas. Fanny, I'm not sure who that artist was, but <laughs> of course we only read Playboy for the articles. Sure, absolutely. The, li the literary content. Or the cartoons. Casey Gleghorn the other day, and um, he's got a new gallery. He's open on La Brea in Los Angeles, and I understand you're going to be having a, another show or a show in Los Angeles with him at some time in the yes. fall? Uh, my baby dog clown killer that was in this show. Maybe baby dog clown killer. baby dog clown killer had to go to L.A. for Casey's show, and it's going to open on uh, uh, August 3rd. Okay, this is a group show, but you're going to be having a one-man show. Yeah, I'm going to do a one-man show. Casey wants to show the class portraits. He's been a big supporter of my work, and I'm really happy to continue working with Casey. And now in L.A., so it'll be awesome. Have you spent any time out in L.A.? I mean, are you I familiar with show, the scene? I had a show. One of my most successful shows ever was at Robert Berman Gallery in L.A. in, in the 90s. And I sold out my girls shooting clowns paintings. And this, Nicolas Cage even bought three of them. Really? Uh, after the show, I had to do three more so he could have some. But then he went bankrupt and they ended up on the internet. <laughs> and, uh, like auctioned off at a furniture store. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess being auctioned off by Nicolas Cage is better than actually being auctioned off by a, a used furniture store. Yeah. Anyway, Mike Cockrell, drawn from life, here at the Mosaic Space, way in the <clears throat> Boondocks in Queens. Come out to Queens. This what is, is gonna it, Hunter? Be, we're going to do more shows here. Mosaic. This is a beautiful space. Mosaic is going to do more stuff okay. in the future. Only took me an hour and a half to find the place after I got here. It's really okay, good. well, thanks a lot. Thanks for taking the time. And as always, you can like this, share, subscribe, recommend it to your friends. And you can leave your thoughts, ideas, comments, criticisms, but please don't be too harsh on Mike. Leave all those things below. The only thing that we ask is that you say, thank you, Kate.
Thanks, Dee Dee. Thanks, Dee Dee King. Yeah, all right, thank you. 